Hey everybody, welcome to the live edition of The Sewing Report this week. And the title does explain it all. This week I really wanted to talk about the word seamstress because I've had some experiences that just make me feel like maybe the term does not really accurately reflect who we are, what kinds of sewing there are, what, there are so many different kinds of sewing, and I just wanted to have a conversation about it because it's been something I've been thinking about for a while, and I will tell you kind of what sparked that all. I do want to make a little housekeeping announcement. If you don't know me, I'm Jennifer Moore, and every Sunday I try to have a live show at 3 p.m. Eastern Time to talk about issues that affect us as a community, talk about weird things I see on the internet, pretty much anything what I'm sewing. Um, so if you like that sort of thing, feel free to join me every week. And I also put up a video on Thursdays that can range from anything from a uh, haul, a review, some, you know, just sharing some of my sewing makes, some tutorials. Hello, beautifully bookish. I've been binge watching your old shows all week. Happy to catch one live. And hello, Gay and Vicky. Nice to see everybody here. And I'm actually gonna, I'm trying a new camera angle because I feel like, uh, and I've, I actually brought in a light this week um, so that it's not so grainy. So anyways, if you are here joining us live, feel free to let me know uh, what you're doing this Sunday, if you're doing any sewing, where you're watching from. Hey, Champagne Twist, L, okay, I know your name now. Champagne Twist uh, is here, and I know you've been watching for quite a few weeks now, but I'm glad that uh, I finally know your name, so that is great. So if you like this sort of thing, feel free to give me a thumbs up, um, just to let me know. And you know what, my husband actually had a good idea. If you do give me a thumbs down, please don't be a lurker. Let me know why, so that I can try to improve the channel, try to improve the content I'm putting out, because that's something that I really want to do, is, uh, is respond to your suggestions and your feedback. So that would be great. Uh, but yeah, we're here live and uh, I'm gonna be, I have the camera like set up so that it's on the monitor. Okay, Social Butterfly Sewing Channel is here. We've got some folks in here. Hello everybody. All right, Vicky's here, we got Gay, Champagne Twist. So to everyone watching, thank you for joining me. And if you're watching it, uh, the replay, don't worry about it. You can still join the conversation in the comments. I'm just gonna move the camera around a little bit just to see a little better. Okay, so Vicki says she has been trying to use the term sewist with her students. And I'll tell you what sparked that all in. So I want, and I also want to let you know that um, I'm going to be trying to link to stuff I find during the week. I share a lot of it on Facebook. So if you don't follow me on Facebook, feel free to like the sewing report page. It is linked in the description box. And I, I pretty much just share anything I see immediately there and ask opinions and share my opinions with you. But I'll tell you what sparked this whole conversation. And it's pretty much whenever somebody like has some sort of generalization about people who sew, a lot of people are very unfamiliar with sewing. So, you know, I get it. They don't know, they don't know a lot, but there's so many different types of sewing that I really do feel like we're like we are stereotyped to death there's that cliche of, you know, an older woman sitting in a rocking chair, you know, making like a flag or something like Betsy Ross style. But that's really not what sewing is. And that really doesn't encompass everything. But I saw, okay, so Vicky, all right, and I'm going to read some comments. Vicky says sometimes the word sewer, like the underground tunnel that carries poo, like sewer. And that is, that's actually a good point. I don't really like the term sewer either. I just feel like it, I don't know. I like sewist, um, and also seamstress also implies that it's only females. And as evidenced by some of the folks I've been in, I've met and interacted with, it's not all women. And it, there's also a stereotype that it's only gay men, and that's not true either. There's a lot of straight men that sew. There's people of all different, and that's the point I'm trying to make, is that there are people of all walks of life who sew. Young, old, kids, you know, we got the stay-at-home mom crowd, we've got me, um, I'm a working professional. So we've got pretty much lots of different people and it's not just one type of person. And that's what I'm trying to hammer home to people who don't sew because, you know, like, and again, when I was starting to sew, I didn't really fit the mold or demo of your typical seamstress type. Um, 
So I don't know. I just feel like, and I feel kind of left out in some ways because because I don't fit into that sort of sort of mold. Um, and I do think. Um, okay, so Sherry says there's a difference between a seamstress and a tailor, and I completely agree. And I also feel like, all right, so here's what sparked my whole. And I've linked. Um, Every week, I'm actually going to try to link to some cool stuff I found in the description. So some articles I find, um, some free patterns that I that I thought were cool. So pretty much anything that I think is interesting, I'm going to put in the description box every week. Even if I talk about it or don't talk about it, um, I'm going to put some information in there um, just as a resource. So the I thought I saw this. I don't know if I would call it an article because. They didn't interview anyone, and it was just pretty much just all based on Facebook photos. But apparently there was a, and this is the first link in under sewing in the news, so if you want to check that out. Um, apparently, and I'll go to the article right now, I guess there was this mother who, her and her daughter, she was, you know, trying to get ready for prom. So the mom, I guess, said in a Facebook post that she had, her and her daughter had approached a local designer. And now that, and, and here's, the, that's the other thing that I, I don't know what that means. Is it someone that like me who sews for fun that she thought was a designer or is it an actual designer that sews clothes for a living and does custom garments? I feel like even the word designer is very vague. So this mother shared her daughter's prom dress fail on Facebook with the, you know, phrase, are you serious? So she shares this picture of the daughter in a dress and it kind of looks like like the dress is not great but uh, but I'll be honest with you um so okay so I'll read this it says a mom who's and this is from Yahoo style or something I don't know how legit of a news source that is so the mom says she was furious about a custom-made prom dress um and she called out the designer on social media posted some pictures and she said that okay so this is what the quote so the designer called my daughter the night before prom to pick up her dress, which she charges $300 for. Are you serious? Was I wrong for wanting my deposit back? So she posts photos of the dress and said that her daughter was devastated. And okay, so here's how the whole thing started. According to Lewis, who I guess is the mom, so Sham Lewis, um, yeah, her real name is Sham, like like pillow Sham or like Sham as in like scam, I guess. I don't know. Um, so it says, according to uh, Lewis, after a dress her daughter Maxia loved on Instagram wasn't available, she turned to local designer Kia Wagner, who did not return Yahoo Styles' request for comment, to create a $300 dress for her June 2nd prom. For a $100 deposit, Kia told my daughter that she would make her something nice with material she already owned and that she wanted to play around with the design. Malexia didn't know anything about what the dress would look like. So on the day of prom, I guess the daughter tried on the dress and was unsatisfied. So her mother asked the woman for a refund. She didn't offer any reimbursement as a professional courtesy. And with two hours before the dance, a friend of hers came to the rescue by offering um, her own daughter's prom dress. So she ended up using the bottom portion and redesigning the top with the help of a speedy designer and a few bucks extra from her mom. So here's the thing. Everyone's kind of destroying this designer you know they're just decimating her without really knowing much about the situation and here's I have a lot of questions about this um you only see the prom dress fail you never see the inspiration dress and from what I could tell from the the uh dress and it's one of those like Beyonce type dresses that's like see-through top you know skirt with like random embellishments on like the boob parts which I don't really understand those dresses. If that's your thing, that's fine. But uh, there's not a lot of support up there. And uh, it it's for a prom that kind of, the dress kind of seems a little inappropriate. I don't know what dress codes are like in schools now. But if I tried to wear a dress like that to my high school prom, and PSA, I do have the prom mug back this week with some water in it. I don't think I would be allowed into the dance. Uh, my prom dress was pretty modest it was long it had spaghetti straps but i didn't have any cleavage showing whatsoever um i also side note i went to the prom by myself um so yeah so i don't know i want to know what kind of school does this chick go to and you know what what is happening but and also like she's wearing underwear in the picture but like 
That's the point. You can clearly see her underwear, which is weird. Um, the dress does not look good, but if I tried, and here's the, the kicker for me, we never see what the inspiration dress looks like, but from the pictures, it looks like obviously this is a very complicated, uh, the inspiration dress must have been a pretty complicated looking couture gown. And for that level of a dress, you would need someone that really specializes in bridal wear and special occasion wear. And I'm gonna tell you, they ain't charging $300. Um, I talked to someone uh, recently, I won't say her name, but she um, is a professional apparel designer and uh, very, very talented seamstress and blogger. And she told me that she charged like $95 and up per hour for any sort of bridal work. So I feel like, and I, I kind of got this same vibe from everybody that on Facebook that I posted this to, but I kind of feel like you weren't getting the designer side. And I kind of suspect that I kind of suspect that um, the woman, this mom and her daughter didn't really, one, do their homework on who they were hiring. Um, and obviously, judging from the dress, uh, the person who made this dress is not that type of seamstress. They don't look like they do custom couture work or anything like that. But I just want to know, like, this, it kind of seems very clear from the article that this mom and daughter don't know anything about sewing. They don't know about the work that goes into it, and they definitely don't know what kind of price ranges designers actually charge for their work. And for, and again, I feel weird about this story because you don't see the inspiration photo, and you only get one side to it. And that's the thing, when you're, you know, I work in television news, if you're reading a story and you only get one person's perspective, that's not a really complete picture of the story and you never hear from the designer. But I want to know, it, it kind of seems like this woman who made the dress from my, from what I've seen, I, I, I don't get the sense she is a professional designer. I get the sense she's like a hobby sewist like me um, and maybe the daughter just found her somewhere. And, and that's, that's kind of how, yeah, exactly. So Sherry says, um, people think it's cheaper to have a gown made, but it isn't. And that is so true. Like if you went to any, you know, Nordstrom's or whatever, I'm sure you could get, I'm sure that dress, that sort of dress would be cheaper to buy than it would be to have someone design for you. Because that sort of design work from that, from what I can tell in that article, um, that dress is a very complicated dress. So you don't get to see the picture. You don't see the inspiration photo anywhere in there. And you never hear from the designer. And $300, like any person who's charging $300 for a dress like that, in my opinion, is probably not a professional seamstress uh, because they would definitely not be charging those prices. So I was kind of wondering, so, and this has happened to me before, where someone finds out you sew and they ask you to do something random. Like they find out you sew and they ask you to make um, couch cushions for them, or they ask you to you know, finish their mom's antique quilt or they, I've been asked to make clothing for people and I tell them, I'm like, look, I'm really not, I'm really not that experienced of a seamstress to where I would feel comfortable doing those types of jobs. So I kind of feel like, from what I can tell, I think this is more of a miscommunication than it is an out, you know, just the designer's fault. And I don't think this woman probably is a dis even, I don't know, and I tried to Google this woman just to see, and I could, she didn't have a website that I could find, and I even looked up the area, I guess they were from Rochester, New York. Um, so I kind of feel like maybe this is what happened. Um, the daughter saw that this woman sewed, um, maybe asked her to, if she could make something, um, probably told her the budget, um, and that does, you know, that looks like it, that, you can tell the person spent a lot of time trying to do it, uh, but the execution, unfortunately, was not there. But you know what? They probably spent days doing it. Like, that's, that, to me, that would be $300 worth of time. And I just feel like the, this mom and daughter obviously just don't understand what, what goes into it. They assume every seamstress has the same skill set level and can do everything. And that's just not true. And that's kind of what sparked this week's topic for me was... Just the fact that people don't, people just have no idea. Um, when you tell them you sew, they get this picture in their mind of, oh, you know, like 
they don't understand the differences. They don't understand the difference between couture sewing, quilting, crocheting, knitting, doing upholstery, doing, you know, uh, like home deck work, like that sort of thing. So I feel like probably that mom and daughter just didn't understand, had some miscommunications with the woman that was making the dress. And that's where I think things went off the train. But to say that it's solely the designer's fault, and someone even wrote on Facebook, I get I got the sense it was a bridezilla situation. And I sort of get that sense as well. Like they they wanted they wanted what looked like a five thousand dollar dress for three hundred dollars. And that's just not let me be clear, that just is not gonna happen. And if I tried to make a dress like the one that it looked like this woman was trying to make, mine would probably look worse. Um uh, so for the effort, you know, you can tell she tried. Like, I've never worked with see-through fabrics before or anything like that. So I kind of got the sense that this woman tried and then was realizing this was not working. But maybe she was in over her head. Like, maybe she was trying to be nice to the team and try to help her out and see if she could do it. But then she probably realized that it was just way she was just in way too deep at that point. And but she got out too late. So the designer, I feel like. She probably should have communicated her skill set better. If she's even a real designer, we don't really know. So that's kind of how... Okay, so we got a couple people joining us. Yes, we were talking about the prom dress mess, and uh, but you never hear the designer side of things. So I don't want to just automatically destroy the designer because we don't really know... We really don't know the full story. And I feel like we're just getting one side from this woman who's obviously very angry about the situation. And, but again, to the mom and daughter, if you think you can get some sort of Beyonce Grammys dress for $300, you have no idea. They just obviously have no idea what all is involved. And that's why I wanted to talk about that this week is just that there's so many different types of sewing, so many different skill levels. It seems like people lump everyone into this one generic term of seamstress. And I think that's a problem because then you get situations like this where, you know, people, you know, they probably heard this lady sewed and assumed she could do that sort of, like, that people just assume you can do things just because you use the term seamstress. But it's weird because you lump, you know, you lump in people like me on a scale of one to ten. My sewing skills are probably like a two or three um, out of a possible ten. And then you also get in, you know, people like uh, Susan Caljay or, you know, other talented, Nancy Zeman, talented uh, seamstresses, you know, Mary Ann Fonz, the noted quilter, you know, everyone's kind of lumped into that one basket of seamstress. And I think we need a, I feel like we need better terminology to explain what people do in the sewing arena. Anyways, what do you think? I mean, do you think this is, have you run into this problem yourself? Um, you know, it's just, just when you tell people you sew, they make so many assumptions that are just not true. You know, they assume and they automatically assume you have an Etsy shop or that you want to sell stuff. And it's just, it, I don't know, it's just something that drives me insane. Okay, so we got a couple comments. Uh, Sherry says, sewing is not a cheap hobby. That is 100% true. Carol, uh, as I told a friend who was going to be schooled to be a mechanical engineer, if you can construct a garment, you can build a house or to that effect anything. And I would, I would agree with that, Carol, because uh, garment construction is a lot of math, and it's three-dimensional math, too. And it's something that uh, boggles my mind. Um, Cena says, just because you sew, don't mean you can make high-end items. And as evidenced by this article about the prom dress, uh, uh, very, very accurate. Yeah, and Vicky says, they assume you can do things or that you want to do. Yeah, like, people just come up to you with all kinds of random... Like, people ask me if I do alterations, if I make, you know, if I can make, like, a duvet cover or something. And I think they meet, they, these people obviously mean well. They just really don't understand anything about it. Um, so I don't know what other terms you would use for the word seamstress. But I feel like the word seamstress just has this notation and people make all kinds of assumptions about that one word that I think causes problems for us because... We have a hard time saying no, like when people, and maybe that's what the designer, you know, maybe that's what happened to the designer. Maybe, maybe this mom and daughter kind of backed them into, backed her into a corner and was like, hey, can you sew this for us? I've got $300. We don't, you know, that's our budget. And maybe she just felt bad and wanted to help. And maybe she didn't feel like she could say no. And that's a problem, I think, for a lot of us out there is 
we have a hard time saying no to people who ask us to sew things. And I, you know, I, at this point I just say, hey, I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm very busy right now and I don't have time to sew for other people. I only have time to sew for myself. Plus, at least since I have a YouTube channel and do the blog, you know, I always tell people, look, you know, I, um, all of my free time is spent on this project. And that's, that's actually very accurate. I have no life outside of um, work and this, uh, sewing and making these videos. Like, I honestly don't do, like, anything else. I don't do anything socially. We don't go to restaurants. You know, I don't go to concerts or you know, festivals or anything like that. I live in Atlanta and there is a lot of stuff to do, but I just never have time. And the time I do have, I wanna, I wanna be sewing, you know, the term. I like to party and by party, that means stay home and sew. That's my idea of a good time. All right, we got a couple more comments. Vicky says, I hate doing alterations. Vicky, that's one, uh, one trick I've learned is just not to learn to do them. So you can just say, Oh, I, I don't know how to do alterations. And people just kind of look at you like you've got, like, you're made of cheese when you tell them you don't know how to do something. Like, well, I thought you sewed. So can you crochet me something? Like, there's a huge difference between these things, and people don't get it. All right. We got another comment. Uh, the Social Butterfly Sewing Channel says, I'm, I think of myself as a textile artist because sewing is truly an art form for me. Penguin and Pear, my boss keeps hinting at commissioning made to make a dress for her, but that's way too, oh yeah, don't do it, Penguin and Pear, do not, do, so, especially if they offer to pay you, like, I'll make things for people as gifts, because as a gift, it's low pressure, I, they're not telling me what to make, I'm making what I want, and that's something that's important to me, is making projects that I care about, not making, you know, 20, you know, tote bags for you or something. So I, I maybe sewed for money once or twice, and honestly, um, I wouldn't do that experience again. I just, I just felt kind of weird about the whole thing, so I'm not, I don't sell anything at this point. All right, we got Sh uh, L Champagne Twist, that's so true, Vicky. Sherry, a seamstress implies a person who sews professionally. I know a couple of seamstresses that do this for a living. And that's the thing, Sherry, is that uh, professional seamstresses, there's a huge difference between them and like somebody like me. So I feel like sewist is a good term. I feel like maybe that's something that we need to use more widely. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like the word hobby sewist, our hobby amateur seamstress is kind of weird. I don't like that. And I don't like be, it being called a hobby. Like, I feel like sewing is so much more than a hobby. I feel like that really downplays it too. So Cena says, uh, the first, my first item is the first few days of learning to sew. I made sugar glider bonding pouches. That's cool and sold them to a pet shop. Now I do alterations for my family and learning to construct right now. And see now, yeah, that's that's cool. You know, at least you found a way to do some projects you like, make a little extra money. Um, but again, the word seamstress just, I feel like using the word seamstress and telling people you're a seamstress just opens the doors for all types of uh, awkward situations, weird conversations, and constantly having to try to educate people on, on what we do and the many types of differences. Um, like one thing I do to try to, you know, help help this is I'll share articles about sewing on my Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, um, especially if it's something that helps educate people who don't know anything about sewing. Like I shared one about quilts, um, and and I said, you know, quilts are very expensive to make and very time consuming. And I share my personal experiences. Like if I tried to make a quilt like this, it would take me a couple weeks. Just so people, you know, and every little bit helps. I think every time we share something like that, maybe it helps educate a couple more people on the realities about sewing because there just there's just so many. But yeah, with that, back to that prom dress story, I feel like it was less about the designer. Like, and people just destroyed this person on, online. And I felt bad. I felt really bad because even though it was it was a fail, it, that dress attempt was still better than anything I could do right now. So I just felt honestly very bad for this person, especially using their name. Um, and the fact that they, like the thing that stands out to me is the fact that they were charging so little. Um, I'm pretty certain that this person does not so, it does not do custom couture sewing for a living because the price was the first thing that stood out to me. I was like $300. They can't possibly be some sort of highly trained professional couture seamstress. That just can't be true. That person would never work for 300 bucks for a dress. 
And again, we never saw the inspiration photo, so I have a lot of problems with that story. Um, and I don't wanna, I, I am not taking that mom's side. I, do, I think she should have done her homework. Also asked for references and looked at photos of past work. If they don't have a portfolio, um, that's probably a sign that they're, they, have, they don't really have a lot of experience. And in that case, um, if your budget is $300, you get what you pay for. Um, if you paid $5,000, you would have gotten a nice dress. That's all I'm saying. Vicky says, the borrowed dress the girl wore looked gorgeous on her. And it did, and that's the thing. People ask me to sew clothing for them, and ask, they're like, oh, I'll pay you. But I know in their mind the price is totally different from what I would have to charge. Um, so that's why I say, hey, I'm really sorry I don't do sewing for other people. Also, sewing for other body types is an art in itself. I don't even, I, I'm still working on my own body. I don't have time to figure out yours, you know? So I think that's, there's a lot of problems that we run into that with friends, family members, coworkers that just end up being kind of, kind of uncomfortable situations for all of us. So yeah, but so yeah, I tell people I don't, you know, I don't sew for money and, you know, just because I know that the price in their mind isn't even in the same hemisphere as the one I'm thinking. So I just say no, um, and I leave it at that. So, I don't know, have you, if you sew or sell things, you know, feel free to comment, let me know what you charge, and also, if you, have you ever had a situation, leave me a comment, let me know, if you, have you had an awkward situation like this where someone asked you to sew something, sew something, and did, then did the trademark, oh, I'll pay you, and then they gave you, like, you know, five dollars or something, because I feel like that is, again, another real problem we face, but, I'm really sick of being, I'm really sick of all these generalizations and assumptions people make about you. Just when you tell them you sew, it's so frust, like it is so frustrating, I can't even tell you. Ugh. All right, we got a couple more comments. Uh, Sherry, I don't mind telling people I'm a sewing hobbyist. And uh, Sherry, uh, it's what a seamstress does, they sew for other people. Yes, yeah, so, so a seamstress, a real legit seamstress does jobs. Um, I am more of a, yeah, I don't know. So I like the word sewist. So so I almost feel like we need a new word. You know, like I, I'm also a quilter, so I make quilts. Um, but I don't crochet. I don't really knit. I don't do a lot of those other things. Yeah, Carol says $5 would be worth five minutes. Yeah, it sounds, sounds about right. Um, but yeah, when I heard from my friend that she charged like $95 and up per hour for bridal work, that that sounds right to me because it is it requires so much skill, so much precision, and a lot of experience. You know, you can't just make a wedding dress. And I think people assume that if you sew, you can just you make anything. And that's so like it takes me if I get a new pattern or try to work on a new project, it takes me a long time to try to figure it out, especially if it's a new concept, if it's a technique I haven't done. Like this week I was practicing uh, buttonholes. Just because I would, you know, I would like to start making clothing with buttonholes, but I was just, I just spent a few hours practicing on the machine to do buttonholes. I wasn't even doing anything. So even besides projects, you're working on techniques, you're making muslins or toiles, and you're really trying to refine your own skill set. And that takes so much time. And that's why I think real seamstresses are they deserved, I feel like that those prices are totally justified. And people who are like, oh, that's crazy. Um, you know, they obviously, they obviously don't sew because if you did sew, you would totally, like you would get it. Um, you would just totally get it. All right, we got Dorty here. I charge $120 for putting in a new zipper and an old jacket. Then they will buy a new jacket. Oh, I like that. So you just charge prices that are like insane. And you know, they're gonna give you, and here's the thing that, kills me is that they give you like some dirty look like you're being mean or something or you're being rude I'm like they're the ones that are being rude by asking you to do that for no money or next to no money and asking you to spend your time doing it and I just think that's insane um so instead of selling things to people um I would just I am honestly I just prefer to make things as gifts I don't you know, if I like the person and I know them and they have something special coming up, I'll just make them something. Got a Melita. I'm glad I finally made it. Oh, keep doing this. Well, thank you very much. And we've got Beautifully Bookish. I love Dressmaker. Okay, yeah, I kind of like that. Um, even though I do make more than dresses, I know it sounds more like, it just sounds more like a hobby and I like the way it sounds. 
<laughs> Obviously doesn't work for men though. Yeah, so I don't know what, I don't know what other kind of words we can use. Maybe we can make one up. Like a lot of companies are made up words, Etsy, Uber, Lyft, you know, before those companies existed, it was just, it was just a made up word. So I feel like we almost need our own, our, we kind of need our own sewing language in order to describe ourselves more accurately. And that's the thing, like I call myself a seamstress, but I feel like there's a better, I feel like there's gotta be a better way to describe that to people. Um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe I should say sewing vlogger and then they'll assume I've I'm just making, you know, cell phone videos like this in my bedroom, which is what I'm doing right now. All right, we got Dirty having having delivered dirty trousers to put a new zipper in. Yeah, go oh boy. And we got Sherry. It costs thirty dollars to get pants hemmed at the cleaners. Hey, that seems totally fair to me. Um, that sounds cool. Yeah. And I think before I started sewing, I got one dress altered at the cleaners. I it was pretty simple. Like I think they just took the dress in a little bit. And I believe they charge, like, and this this is how bad I was before sewing. It was some, I, I got a dress to take in. It was some polyester cheap thing from Forever 21 that cost me like $15. And I paid another 20 to get it all, to get it taken. Because they only had a size that was too big for me. Um, I forgot where I wore it. I think it was like a company Christmas party or something like that. But I don't know. I spent more to get the dress altered than on the dress itself. Um, and it was just seriously, it was like cheap, cheap, super cheap fabric. All right, we've got champagne twist. When I explained for the umpteenth time that I show dresses for myself and not for others as a career, a now ex-friend kept asking me to make clothes for her. She said, she said she would even pay me. And yes, that's so, that drives me insane is when people are like, I'll pay you. Like that makes it all better. But you know, again, we all know that the price they're thinking of is not even remotely close to your price, to your price that you would actually do it at. Um, so you know in your mind, you're like, this is never going to happen. This cannot happen. I just have to get out of here. Um, so I don't know. I just say, hey, I'm really sorry. I don't sew anything for other people. I only, I only sew for myself. And that phrase has kind of saved me a few times. Uh, Vicky. People look at me really funny when I tell them how much I would charge pants. And Vicky, how much do you tell them? Uh, you should say like $75 and then they'll give you a dirty look. I could just buy a new pair of pants for that price. And you should say, then you, sh you should go do that then because it will be cheaper. Um, and I do tell people sewing um, sewing for yourself is, is more expensive compared to the stores that most everybody shops at. Now again, sewing is much cheaper than buying a Chanel jacket or you know a you know a Versace dress or something. But most of the people we know aren't aren't buying that stuff anyways. They're shopping at Target and Forever Twenty One and H and M and all those really. And it drives me crazy too to people when people are going on those fast fashion sites. Like there's like a gazillion of them, and then they're like, oh look at this dress for nine ninety nine, and I'm just sitting there shaking my head, being like, oh my gosh, you have no idea. You have no idea. All right, we've got Cena. Seamstress is a female version of a male, of a tailor, and not a fashion designer. And that's the thing. Like, I feel like the, like, real seamstresses, real seam, like, real legit seamstresses, um, I think they should start branding themselves as a real, like, I'm a couture, like, maybe say I'm a couture fashion designer or something like that. Because uh, that denotes, you know, dollar signs, you know, and me saying I'm a hobby sewist or a sewist. Um, you know, might work better, but I don't know. I feel like we can come up with something better. Like, I feel like even those terms don't cut it. And that's why we are talking about this today. So if you have any suggestions or any things that you, yeah, I like textile artists, because that again denotes real artist. Um, Vicky charges $15 to hem pants. That seems very fair to me. And Sherry says, that's when I learned to sew, learned how to alter my clothes. In full disclosure, I did get one of those Angela, I did get a couple Angela Wolf alteration craftsy classes. I just haven't made my way through them at this point. Um, so yeah, so that's where we are now. And uh, yeah, and the whole, this whole train of thought was really sparked by that one article where I'm like, oh my gosh, people are really decimating this dress designer, but they have no idea what it takes and they're doing it without really knowing these people making these judgments about this designer are making judgments that they they can't they really shouldn't be making because they don't know anything about sewing so 
That's what I think. All right, Doherty says, I did the couture line for three years. The school also had a designer line. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, Sherry wants to make a Chanel-like jacket. And Sherry, that's actually one of my goals as well. Um, I saw that Craftsy class on making the Chanel-style jacket, and I was, I was intrigued by that. Also, I saw that um, a really, really notable... Um, a really, really notable seamstress, Susan Calgy, has like this week-long workshop where you can sew with her and either make a couture dress or one of those jackets. And that looks really cool to me. Um, it's kind of expensive, but it looks really awesome. So that would be pretty amazing. And uh, Vicky says, I don't have pants anymore. The person said, that's almost as much as the pants cost. And yeah, that's the whole point. Um, and also, and this also drives me crazy, you cannot compare a someone sewing something in the United States um, to the sourcing of a lot of these clothing companies. A lot of these clothing companies are using really cheap materials. They're using exploitative, la exploitative labor and they're doing it overseas. So you really can't pair, compare the cost of making fast fashion to uh, doing it here. Um, that's just, you know, it, the, the math is just much different. And people are very desensitized to these cheap prices and they expect those cheap prices to get much better stuff. And that's what I think is kind of crazy. Like, um, if I went into a BMW dealership and I was expecting a $40,000 car for $5,000, there's no way I would get that. And that's what I feel like people do to us is that they ask you for something that costs $200 and they only want to pay 20, 20 bucks. And, and I feel like we need, as, as a community, we could do more to uh, combat this and defend ourselves because um, just maybe a just say no campaign, I don't know, um, or just educating more people on the real cost of better fashion because the fashion that most people are paying for now is fashion that, um, as we've, you know, I've talked about this before, but it's just not sustainable in a business model where you're paying people a real wage and where you're making it stateside. Um, for example, um, a few years ago I went to Reese Witherspoon's a store in Nashville called Draper James. She has her own uh, company now. She makes, she has a couple stores and I went into the store, first of all, if you've never been to Draper James, it is super cute. The website's really cute. They have, it's very Kate Spade-like. Uh, but they have very whimsical, fun prints. Um, although I noticed a lot of the clothing is dry clean only, so I'm like, oh, screw that. Um, I really prefer stuff that, that could be washed in the washing machine. If it can't be thrown in the washing machine, I really tend not to buy, oh, sorry, my leg is like really wobbling the desk and that's that's bad. Um, I'm also gonna move the camera a little bit because I'm switching my, uh, I'm kind of switching around my, uh, where I'm sitting, but, um, but at Draper James, I went into the store and it was like, I got a little bit of sticker shock. Like a pair of jeans was like $120. Dresses were $300. And even I, and at the time I did sew a little bit, but I didn't know as much as I do now. Even at that time, I was kind of like, wow, this stuff is really expensive. I didn't buy anything. But then I read later, and I'll look at our website now. Most of the things from Draper James are made more responsibly. They are made in the United States, um, you know, like her jeans are made in Georgia. And after I found that out, that very much explained the prices. The prices are, they are a little more of a premium brand, but again, the stuff is being made in the U.S., not overseas. So I think that really, um, I feel like, you know, we could educate people that we come across and share with them what what kind of clothing they're getting for the, the that $20. You know, real people are making these clothes, and I think it's important that people know, um, you know, I think this whole move to shop ethically respond, shop in an ethically and environmentally responsible way is very important. And that's something that I, I want to try to do is to try to, um, is to try to really slow slow this whole explosion of fast fashion because you know obviously it's not very good for the planet and uh you know there's a lot of people that might be getting taken advantage of not being paid real wages there's a lot of safety dangers in a lot of these workplaces that you can see there's tons of articles there's also a netflix documentary called the true cost of fashion 
that I watched part of, and that's pretty interesting. All right, so I'm going to read a couple comments. Got Desardi Genius, and welcome everyone who's joining me live. Um, I do a lot of embroidery, and I'll do it during my classes. One piece I was working on a friend wanted, um, so I told her my price, and she literally said to me, oh, I don't like paying for things. Well, must be nice to be her. Does she pay her rent? Does she pay for her car? How does she pay for food if she doesn't like paying for things? I mean, nobody likes, like, that's so stupid. Nobody likes paying for things, but that's just something we have to do. That's, that's crazy. Um, Cena says, uh, what's in store is made, re made to wear, yeah, ready to wear. That's something you learned in fashion school. Sherry says, making a Chanel is a good investment. You have it for years and have a, it's a timeless look. Cost is mostly labor because it can take a couple weeks to make, and she also loves wool. I also love wool as well, so I feel you on that one. But yeah, so if you have any stories about um, friends, uh, yes, and that is a hair dryer on the floor behind me. Don't know why, but at least my head is covering it up for the most part. I'm gonna get a drink of water. But yeah, that's something we come across all the time is just people who just don't know anything about sewing and just coming to you with some crazy request. So in the comments, my question of the day is, uh, share some crazy stories about things people have asked you to sew. And also what kind of price, like when you told them what kind of prices uh, they were expecting, like this woman that wanted a designer dress for $300. Sorry, lady, that that's just not, that's just not happening. Um, and Sherry also recommends the book, and I've heard of this book too. And you know what? I'm going to put it in the description box because I think that's a good recommendation. Uh, it's called Overdressed. I have not personally read the book, uh, but I've, I've heard of it in several times, and it's something that I should, I should probably read. Um, so I will put that in the description box for you to look up. Yeah, and apparently it's, about, it's all about the fast fashion industry and just more kind of it's, you know, and I think these kind of pieces, these, this kind of... Uh, information is good for people you know sort of like how when the book fast food nation came out and once people are like oh my gosh there's literally like um cow crap in the meat um yeah you know that's uh you know the things can be a little eye-opening when you tell people what's really in the food what's really what's really involved in sewing a garment and it's a lot so i do feel like people if they understood maybe little by little they'll start to um, they'll start to get it. And I think that I don't know what else we can do. Also, if you have any suggestions for how us as a community can, um, can help, can help further this along, let me know because I think that's a, a really interesting, all right. So we will link to that. And this is overdressed, the shockingly high cost. All right. And I'll put book recommendation. All right. Book recommendation. All right, so in a second, if you refresh this, you will see the link to the Overdressed book. And it's actually a book that I would, I should probably get. Um, it's only 10 bucks and it's called Overdressed, the shockingly high cost of cheap fashion. And that's the thing, somebody is paying for that $5 shirt, it just isn't you. Um, you're just getting the benefit of a lot of other people being exploited. Um, okay, so, and I'll read the synopsis of the book. Okay, so, and this is the thing, yeah, I read the book Fast Food Nation. I actually, everything by that author, Eric Schlossinger, or whatever his name was, um, I actually read all of his books. Um, I also really enjoy books like Freakonom or, uh, Freakonomics, I think that's what it's called, um, and they also have a podcast. I think things like that are interesting, where you just really share the story behind things, and, and dig deeper, and learn more about different things, um, random topics. Like that book, uh, uh, Freakonomics had like a, uh, a one chapter on like why drug dealers live with their mothers. And it was actually interesting. So this guy, and this is totally not about sewing, but I don't care. This guy um, went undercover, or not undercover, but a, somehow a local drug gang let him like look at their books and embed himself with them for in the name of like research and he didn't get killed that was the most amazing part is that he didn't get murdered or anything um because that seems like a very dangerous thing to do but this guy um so this guy got to look at their books and then he learned that drug dealers really don't make that much money um it's sort of like okay it's sort of like my business television news people assume if you work 
in news or if you're on TV, you're making boatloads of money. But really, it's just a couple people at the top. And then as you go lower on the totem, pe totem pole, people don't make that much money. Um, and I think that's the thing. It's saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Sherry. Okay, so Sherry says, I, I work at WNYC Studios that produces Freakonomics. Oh my gosh, I listen to the podcast all the time. They produce Radio Lab as well. The Freakonomics podcast, and I'll, you know what, I want to put a link to that too. The Freakonomics podcast is amazing, um, and I listen to it all the time, and the books are great. Um, so this this book, um, I think this was in the book, it was called like Reefer Nation or something, and it covered a few, like it covered like a, some different topics, like I forgot, it's been a while since I read the book, but um, anyways, I'm getting off, off on a huge tangent, but this guy embedded himself with the drug gang, and learned that um, most of the drug dealers made like less than minimum wage after you accounted for all the expenses. And there were a couple guys at the top that made um, all the money and then everyone else below them made like nothing, like less than you would make if you worked at McDonald's. So that's why the chapter was called Why Drug Dealers Live With Their Mothers. Sherry, I'm very jealous because I'm obsessed. I'm kind of obsessed with the Freakonomics people. And um, just, there's just something, I don't know, it's just something I'm like totally fascinated by. But I will link to the Freakonomics podcast. And if you haven't listened to it, you can download it for free. And it's a great, um, actually, I'll link you to the website. And then you can actually, um, yeah, it's got like a link to the pod, you can, yeah. So you can, yeah, you can link to the podcast and it's got all this other stuff. Like you can listen to the episodes, they're all free and it's a great it's, they have a lot of random topics, but they did one, or maybe it was Planet Money. I also listened to one called Planet Money, and, um, you know, they really just do a really interest. they really do really interesting pieces on random things you would have never thought to learn more about. Um, so I like to listen to it just to get some ran more random knowledge up in the noggin here, uh, you know, because, I don't know, who knows. All right, so Freakonomics, I'm going to link to this. So if you refresh your screen in a second, hopefully you will see the Freakonomics uh, podcast. Um, so yeah, and oh, I, I did want to share. Okay, you should try listening to Death, Sex, and Money. Oh yeah, so Planet Money is one I also listen to, which is cool. Um, I'm also a big fan of the Dave Ramsey show. So I like to listen. I don't listen to music, like really at all. I mostly just listen to um, talk radio and podcasts. That's sort of my... That's sort of my big thing. All right, I'm gonna look at some of the more comments. So death, sex, money. So Sherry, that's very cool that you work at WNYC. Very neat. Okay, so Rara is here, hello. Doing paid work for friends is generally a bad idea. Do it as a favor or not at all. Mixing business with friendship is asking for trouble. I uh, very much agree with that. Um, if I'm gonna do something, it's gonna be as a gift and not as a business transaction. I think that tends to sour relationships. So um, I, I'm very wary of any sort of money, financial transaction, or any sort of thing like that where that involves someone you have a relation, you have a personal relationship with. Um, and even Dave Ramsey says, you know, if you're give a, a financial gift, give a monetary gift, don't lend anyone money. And I, I think that's very good advice. Uh, so I don't, I don't do that. And I think that's a good, a good thing to do. But if you have any other suggestions, and also again, I want to hear your crazy stories on things people have asked you to sew for them, and you know what happened when you tried to explain that you need to charge real prices, because uh, you know usually that kind of ends the conversation, is when you tell them, um, you know, and I will link. So I was so ins I like Freakonomics so much. I wrote an article a few years ago that kind of went viral in the quilting community called Quiltonomics. And I interviewed a bunch of people. I interviewed a bunch of people about, um, and I'll link, it's on my old blog, and I'll link that one because it's got a lot of com. It got a lot of comments. Um, but um, I interviewed some people in the quilting industry to talk about quilt prices. And, um, you know, just to bust the stereotypes that everyone everyone who sews must sew something. You must sell all your quilts. When in reality, very few professional quilters actually sell their quilts. They make money blogging, teaching, doing competitions, writing books, designing fabric, designing patterns. Um, but a lot of them, you know, most of the quilters I spoke with don't 
actually sell quilts. And actually one of the few people in the article who did at the time, Susie Quilts, she doesn't really sell quilts anymore. She's also gone the route of designer and, um, and blogger and teacher. So I think most people, most of the people I know who sew um, don't sell things. And you know what, the people I do know who have Etsy shops, um, it's again, more of a hobby. It's not like some sort of high money-making enterprise they've got going on. Um, I've seen a lot of people, and frankly, I think a lot of people on Etsy that I see selling handmade things, they they, very, they charge prices that are artificially low. Like they're trying to compete with the Walmarts and Targets when they shouldn't be and can't be. Um, so the one thing I do think, and you know, I'll link this as well. I also wrote something a while back in sewingreport.com about um, how I think we should market quilting as a luxury item. And I think we should do the same thing for sewing. So I think that if we marketed um, what we do as a luxury, something that's um, more of a status symbol, and I know that sounds a little bit elitist, but I think it's something we would have to do to get real prices, um, then we could maybe start to turn the page on what people think of handmade items. When you think of handmade items, you don't think of expensive. You think they're like cheap tchotchkes people sell on Etsy or at flea markets or something. You don't think of a $10,000 quilt. Um, so I think that's something that really we could do a better job of marketing ourselves um, to, you know, just to really start to, you know, like if we were able to charge real prices for what we do, more people would be able to make a living sewing. And I think that would be great. And in turn, I think more people would sew if they were actually able to make money at it. But it's so it seems very difficult to make money sewing handmade items. Um, that a lot of people don't do it and can't do it. So I think that's uh, something, to, something to think about. All right, so um, yes, yeah, so I wrote something and I'll, every once in a while in Sewing Report, I'll write something random with my opinion. And it's that I think quilts need to be a luxury item. And um, you know, I think that, I, again, I think that's editorial. I'm gonna link this below in the description box as well. Quilts need to be a luxury item. And I think that would, I honestly think that would help us if if instead of us, I think the marketing needs to change of sewing and quilting. And that's what I think is something that we can do and also something that the sewing industry needs to do um, is, and also to target different demographics. Like it seems like the average sewing related company is targeting older females um, just with the, content they're putting out, the personalities they have representing the industry. And I think that just helps perpetuate that stereotype that is only one type of person. So I think that's something that, that the industry overall could do better at. So anyways, oh, and I wanted to show you what I sewed. I have linked this free uh, pattern below. I did sew this yesterday and I'm working on a, a baby romper for uh, my neighbor. Um, so this is a free pattern by Pearl Soho. It's called uh, the Baby Sun Bonnet. And I think it's really cute and it was really easy. And it was pretty quick once I cut out all the pieces. So again, this sort of looks, this sort of looks a little old fashioned, but hopefully it'll be cute on the baby. Um, and again, I just know as gifts, I don't sell anything. So uh, that's where I'm at. But uh, anyways, guys, I gotta sign off soon because I've got a lot to do today. Um, but this has been a lot of fun, and let's keep the conversations going in the comments. So after this live stream ends, you can leave a comment still, although the comments in the live stream don't save. But, oh, and next week, I'm pretty sure this show will be pre-taped because I have a lot going on next weekend. Um, can't get into details, but um, next week will probably be a pre-taped show. I'm about 90% sure. Anyways, this has been a lot of fun, and I will see you guys all next week. Have a good one.